For the Wild podcast is brought to you by our sponsor, the Calliopeia Foundation. Calliopeia believes in supporting individuals and organizations that work to transform our ecological, cultural, and spiritual relationships with each other and our common home. We thank Calliopeia for their ongoing support of creative projects that we believe in. To learn more, visit calliopeia.org. Hey, For the Wild community, it's Ayana here, and we are about to share with you an encore episode with Kurt Russo on The People Under the Sea. This episode is extremely timely, especially because of the Trans Mountain Pipeline that just got passed in Canada, and the dams, the pipelines, are directly related to the health of salmon and orca, so it feels like a really timely episode to be sharing with you again now. And to support Kurt's work and stay up to date, you can follow sacredsea.org. Also, I do want to mention that Tokatai has still yet to be released, and if you haven't heard this episode, you will hear more about this incredible being from Kurt. So enjoy this encore episode while we prepare the In the Field episodes coming up shortly. And for those of you who aren't aware, I've been heading to Alaska through Cascadia for the last few years, recording incredibly personal and intimate relationships with people on the front lines of massive resource extraction projects that are threatening the last remnants of the wild. So our, our prayers go to J-50 and her mother, her family, the Sailor Sea and, and all our relations, and to your listeners that they keep their hope up, <clears throat> even if their pessimism grows, stay hopeful, because as one person once told me, <clears throat> you're an activist, you are not allowed to lose hope. The silence is broken by somebody crying Trying to be heard, never a word Always the attitude, sort out your own Always alone, wishing for something The world is denying Out in the wilderness, somebody's crying Hello and welcome to For the Wild podcast. I'm Ayana Young. Today we are speaking with Kurt Russo. Kurt has worked on environmental issues, land preservation, and treaty rights with the Lummi Nation for 40 years. He is a senior strategist for the Lummi Nation's Sovereignty and Treaty Protection Office, coordinating the Lummi Nation's Sailor Sea Campaign and the Tokatai Repatriation Project. He is also the executive director of the Foundation for Indigenous Medicine and the former director of the Native American Land Conservancy. He holds a BS and MS in forestry and a PhD in history. Well, thank you so much, Kurt, for joining us today. And before I begin, I would just like to extend the deepest of gratitude from all of us at For the Wild for the passionate and moving work you are doing on behalf of the Southern resident orcas and in working to bring Tokatai back home to her natal waters and relatives who await her. Thank you. And it feels only right that we begin our more than human theme month in honor of the mother orca Taliqua, who carried her dead calf on a tour of grief for more than a thousand miles over a 17 day period. And it's a profound reminder that we share our place and experience with other beings that bear memory, whose capacity for love and loss mirror our own. And it also highlights the uncertainty of the Southern residents' livelihood, and quite frankly, the livelihood of our planetary community, if we continue to act with reckless abandon. And I see Taliqua's act as a communicative plea to our humanity, as an acute demonstration of the wisdom that these kin possess. So could you begin by sharing with us what Lummi cosmology might make of this happening and 
what place orcas occupy within Lummi cosmology more broadly? Now, cosmology is one of those words that sort of you sort of drop back into your eyes, if you know what I mean. I can tell you what I've been told about those questions. There was a time, and uh, there was a Lummi word for this in their cosmology, which is spelled E L H N E X W T E X W. And that refers to a time when all life forms were one and related. And that time is a time when the Kualalmich and the blackfish and the, the young ones, the humans and others, all were one. The Kualalmachin is considered one of the people that lives under the water. That's what the word means, blackfish. So their, their cosmology, like I said, is a big word. Um, so if you can imagine, because that's what it takes, right? Blackfish, but take out the image you have in your mind and imagine that people are actually blackfish as much as blackfish are people. It's all in family. And that's very unusual and it's very unique. And the same is true for salmon. The salmon woman um, speaks, spoke to Lummies about their sacred obligation to the creation. <clears throat> I'm uh, in a very uh, emotional state right now. You have to bear with me. fact is that you're right and and this is what I've heard the chief of the Lummi Salik is his name say this Talikwa was showing to the world what the ones that live above the water are doing look <sighs> ah, look at my dead baby Look, look at my dying ocean. Look for a thousand miles in 17 days till I put her down and I won't eat all that time. The last surviving calf that was born to the J-Pod since 2015. He's missing. That calf is called Scarlet J50. And we know from the rake marks on J50's side that she was midwifed into birth by other members of the pod. Midwifed, pulled out of her mother by other killer whales to give life to little Scarlet. Pulled out and midwifed. These are the people that live under the water. So yes, the Lummi cosmology goes back to the, that tongue that is known as the every when, every when, E-V-E-R-Y-W-H-E-N, and the before time and one time. And that's the time we're speaking in now. The uh, fact is, there are worlds within worlds, and the Sailor Sea is showing us that one world that we are living in is in a deep crisis. And the people that live above the water have to understand they don't own this place. Their presidents don't own it. Their congressmen don't own it. They don't own it. They were gifted it. Until that's understood, We'll see more dead calves. So that's what I have to say to that. Hmm. Thank you for your um, your emotional connection. It really uh, expresses the grief and the pain around these beautiful beings, these kin that are speaking to us. And I, I truly believe that. 
So the Lumi reverence for their orca kin brings us to the story of Tokatai or Lolita, an orca who is currently kept at Miami Sequarium in Florida. And I'm wondering if you could share with us this story, beginning with the traumatic capture of Tokatai back in 1970. We have a website, which we've talked to you about, called sacredsea.org. Sacred Sea all runs together, .org. And on that website is the work we're doing for the Salish Sea, and part of that work for the Salish Sea <clears throat> is the rescue and repatriation of Tokatai. So on that website is a button called Media Resources, and on that button, Media Resources, are two videos. And one video is a trailer of a film we're doing about the return of Tokatai, its introduction. And the other is the chief of the Lummi Nation speaking about Kualalmachin. Tokatai, if you would see the original footage taken in Penn Cove in 1970, it's very hard to even recount, but by the captive industry, they were herded in by dynamite. And uh, underwater explosions, they were herded into a cove. And they took whale after whale after whale after whale. <clears throat> Seven whales died, they drowned. Four young ones died, they were drowned. And each of the drowned whales was their stomachs cut open with cement blocks put in to sink them so they wouldn't be found. These were human beings that did this. If you see, hear the keening, keening is the sound killer whales make when they are highly distressed. People that are in Penn Cove that day will tell you the haunting sounds of the screams of the killer whales of the matriarch spy hopping desperately to search for their family as they were taken onto ships and vanished. The keening is almost too much to bear. Tokatai was taken out of the water that day. She was four years old. And these captains of the universe, of SeaWorld and others, who arrogate to themselves the right to take these beings captive, shipped her off to Miami. This is a whale that lives most of its water. Its temperatures average about 50 degrees. She's taken to Miami at four years old. 17 other whales were shipped off that day to other sea circuses for people to be treated Tricks for treats for the whales. They educate their kids about killer whales, right? She was placed in a concrete tank 80 feet long and 20 feet deep for 47 years. She's the only surviving wild orca in North America in captivity. She's the last one. They all died within 15 years. There was a killer whale placed in the Seaquarium, Miami Seaquarium's tank, and if I sound angry, it's simply because I am. Another killer whale was in, placed in the tank with her. His name was Hugo. And Hugo committed suicide. He smashed his head up against the side of the tank until he was dead. They disposed of his water like waste into a landfill. So she was left alone with two young porpoises. And she's been there ever since, and the Lummi Nation had heard about this some years ago, but until recently um, didn't really bring the full weight to bear to get her free and back to her family. Her mother is still alive. Her mother is now the matriarch of the L-Pod. If you were to go outside Miami Seaquarium, stand there in the middle of the night, you will hear Tokatai singing. You will hear her voice. She has done that every night for 47 years. So we have, and Joel James, my colleague and, and inspiration, is a master carver of totem poles. And he carves a totem pole in dedication to the reunion and return and rescue of Tokatai. So that 
totem pole is now in Gainesville, Florida, at the University of Florida, where it's going to be brought out on December 10th for exhibit, along with an exhibit at the Staler Sea. It's part of our campaign we're working with to get her free, get her here, get her home, get her well, get her strong, and get her back to her mother. And we will do that, and it'll be done within two years. Miami Sea Aquarium doesn't take it seriously, but they will soon enough. They say she's worth $20 million. We're not going to pay anything to get her out of there. And the tribe was called to do this by, let's put it this way, it wasn't a phone call. <laughs> they were told to get this done. So we're getting it done. She's with the LPOD, JKN LPOD, make up the southern residents. Southern resident killer whale population spend a lot of their lives in Lummi waters, traditional waters. So we have a sanctuary ready for her to return to near Orcas Island in the San Juan Islands where her family tours by routinely. There will be a moment sometime in the next two and a half years when Tokatai is going to be singing out her song and her mother is going to hear it. She can hear it 10 miles away. And they are going to reunite. And that's our job, is to make that moment happen. And the sailors see when that moment occurs, will never look the same again to anybody. That's the Tokatai campaign. Hmm. Wow, Kurt, that's so raw. And hearing the details of these captures is devastating, but so necessary for us to hear it's just insane to think in 1970 that over 40 orca calves were captured and sold. Eight adults were killed at the time. And like you were saying, the pods were just completely frantic. Um, yeah. So I, I just feel compelled to underscore just how traumatic the capture of these orcas was. Like you were saying, to this day, human residents of the area recall hearing the frantic keens of matriarch orcas as their children were torn from the sea by helicopters. Similarly, resident orcas avoid Penn Cove, where their relatives were stolen and have done so for the past 50 years. In an article written by Jay Julius, who you had mentioned, the chairman of the Lummi Nation, Julius writes, quote, just like Tokatai, members of the Lummi Nation have endured centuries of destructive policies. Policies that separated our families, depleted our salmon runs, desecrated our sacred sites, and reduced our traditional fishing areas to a fraction of what they once were. These policies and willful disregard for our treaties have damaged the health of the Salish Sea and negatively impacted the well-being of our people, end quote. I'm curious about the connections between government policy that separated human families, as well as those that have done the same to the Southern residents. How do these stories of separation tell one another? And how does Tokatai's abduction reflect the failure of policy to protect the Sailor Sea? Well, that's a that's an important question. I think it has many different levels that you come in to try to answer it. I'm not going to pretend to know most of the answers, but one thing, it speaks to something clearly out of order in the way our society deals with life forms, even their own. There's something seriously wrong with all of this. It's not just normal. It's not just normal for a person to come into a community and steal children. But what's painfully normal is the ability for people to rationalize doing it. Everyone that did these things, these government agents, or these agents of the sea circuit industry, they may be great brothers and mothers, and, but yet they do these things. And they can explain it to themselves. So, you know, I was told once, by a woman who counseled battered women. And I, I got to know her fairly well. She once told me, <clears throat> there's only one thing most important. 
and it is how you explain yourself to yourself. Everything flows from that. I actually met a gentleman who was involved in the captures in Penn Cove when he was 15. He was part of the capture team. I said, how could you do that? And he said, well, I was only 15. And I said, well, I was 15 once. I wouldn't have done that. It's complicated. But now he's involved in orca rescue. So it came back to haunt him. I, I think, I fear, and I hope that my fears are wrong, that there's something missing in the way we treat Life, not just orcas, but each other. There's something missing in the day-to-day -day cruelty we see in the paper. I had a dear friend who was very involved in Buddhism. She's a very well-placed in that tradition. And she went to a seven-month silent retreat, seven months of silence. I said, what was the hardest thing when you came out? You said the front page of a newspaper. Violence after violence after violence. The front page stories of people being less than human to their world and each other. And I think killer whales and boarding schools draw a line that we need to pay attention to, that we're being, we're being, how can I put this, molded by a system or a process or something to do things unspeakably cruel to each other and to perfectly innocent life forms that doesn't, have done nothing to us <laughs> but inhabit the same planet. There's something missing. There's a presence of an absence. And that's, I think, what connects what a human being can do to a sentient being that has the form of a killer whale, and how a human being can do that to a six-month-old native child, carrying it from the arms of its mother and shipping it 2,000 miles away. You know, I, Jewel and I have worked around the world. And one time we found ourselves in Brazil having an audience with a gentleman who was trying to stop the construction of a nuclear power plant they were going to build on the coast between Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo. And we thought, well, there's madness. So we're having an audience with this gentleman who was fighting it. And he was asked, are you an optimist? He laughed and he said, no, 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 I'm not. I'm hopeful. I uh, I have been so distressed by this that I had to go see a therapist. And I said to her, J50 and the residents, I said, I can't stop crying. <clears throat> I know why. She said to me, <clears throat> She said to me, because you work every day with people with great empathy for their world, and it's true, empathy is The ability to take on the impressions of the other. And I think that when the world saw that grieving mother, it took on that mother's song. And a kind of mea culpa.
one can only hope that <clears throat> one can only hope that we find J fifty little Scarlet alive. Seems unlikely. I was mentioning this to someone here in the tribe about how this morning the the residents very unusual. We're all traveling together. And the J-Pod was in the lead. Tight formation. And the lead of the J-Pod was J-50's mother. <clears throat> it's called the grief formation. The entire resident population standing with the mother who probably just lost her four year old baby. That wasn't in the formation, and nobody knows where it is. I need to say this, though. It didn't have to turn out this way. J50 could have been saved. But she died, like more than likely, she died of starvation. Her mother was trying to feed her. Her family shared their food with her. Isn't that amazing? But it wasn't nurturing her because, well, we don't know why. Because they're living in, they're living in a sick ocean. We uh, here in the tribe participate in the uh, governor of the state of Washington's Southern Resident Killer Whale Task Force. Yeah, well, it's not rocket science what these killer whales need. They need food. <laughs> they need 580,000 pounds of Chinook a year to survive. They're not getting one-tenth that. If they really cared about this, rather than having task force debate over how many angels can dance on the head of a pin, all they've got to do is take down the Snake River dams. They can do that in two months. They don't even need congressional approval to do it. That's where the Chinook were decimated for those dams. But no, instead they're talking about Slowing down ferries, you know, or asking tribes to stop fishing in areas that they're entitled to. You know, it's madness. You know, one thing I'll mention to you, but the four dams on the lower Snake River on the Columbia have produced only two hours of electricity that's been needed in the last 10 years. Two hours. Why do we have those dams? 75% of all the Chinook that try to get down that river are crushed in the dams. You know, it's kind of decision time. And I think people that love your show, and I, I we honor them, we honor them. Um, have to Help us understand how we can turn this big ship of a way of life perched on the edge of the Salish Sea that is destroying it. Because that's what's going on. I mean, this is, they say, when industry arrives, salmon go away. And when salmon goes away, killer whales die. Chinook is the only food southern residents will eat. They don't eat anything else. If there's no Chinook, you don't have any Southern residents. It is uh, it's a situation that we, we simply have to understand. We can win this, but not without an awful lot of leaning into the issue and sacrifice.
The most immediate and pressing threat for the southern resident orcas is starvation. Due to the Snake River dams, the Chinook salmon, their primary food source, cannot spawn. Action points for this episode include calling Governor Jay Inslee at 360-902-4111 to insist they take action to breach these dams. Secondly, call the U.S. Army Corps at 202-761-000 to insist the same. Third, call the Department of Fisheries and Oceans at 604-666-0384 to insist on a cap on salmon fishing. And lastly, in your personal life, to choose to stop eating Chinook salmon, the main food source for our orca kin. I want to talk a little bit more about the issue of the Chinook salmon, uh, basically the collapse of salmon fisheries in Washington, Oregon, California, British Columbia, and now Alaska. And Jeez. I've been up in Alaska for the last two and a half months yeah. and been doing interviews with people around salmon. Uh basically being on a listening tour and it's really devastating to hear in these last vestiges of intact ecosystems that people have been saying, I don't know where the kings are. We don't know where the coho or the, they call them the silvers. They're not coming back. We don't know where they're going. They're going out to sea. They're not coming back. And there's a lot of questions and a lot of confusion and, and just really not knowing why they're not coming home, the, the salmon. So I'd like to hear more from you about the Chinook specifically and what's happening to the fisheries in Washington and in, the, in near the Salish Sea. Why do you think, although we could state some obvious pointers of why we think they're collapsing, I'd like to hear from you, your point of view on their collapse and you know what is their state in the area and what are what are the things that people can do to support the return of the fisheries? Yeah, it is. Um, <clears throat> it's been um, it's been known for three decades or more what the basic problem is in terms of the ninety eight percent reduction of salmon runs between nineteen twenty and nineteen ninety ninety eight percent, and an awful lot of that, whether it's whatever part of you're talking, the Washington State, Pacific Northwest, a lot of this habitat loss, just they've lost their, they can't even get to where they need to spawn. And when they get there, the spawning grounds are no longer viable. This habitat loss is a lot of it, not all of it, but a lot of it, a lot of it. And it's one of those things which, it is allowing Window dressing to pass as a solution, for example, having buffer zones. Oh, I love that one. Buffer zones along a stream, and above the buffer zone, well, you can do anything. <laughs> it's laughable. My, my, like I said, my degree is in forestry. We knew in forestry in 1968 what you had to do to protect salmon. The science is not new, though they always seem to need more of it. But science doesn't make its well in, way into politics, and it doesn't make its way into practices on the ground because it is not profitable to do it responsibly in the Nooksack Basin where I am now. It would take a century to get the habitat back. Habitat loss, and then you have contamination. I mean, the Sailor Sea, especially in the southern portions, but really, I'll give you an example, down in Seattle, <clears throat> When the uh, the beginning of World War II and the Japanese were forcibly removed from their homes and sent to various camps, quote unquote, there were a lot of strawberry farmers, Japanese strawberry farmers that had uh, truck farms in the Seattle area. Guess who owns their land now? Boeing. So Boeing moved in and took their land to build whatever they build. One of the places that they build military drones is some of the most important salmon estuary in southern Puget Sound that they have completely destroyed. 
habitat loss, contaminants, whether it comes from off the roads, through the sewage system, out of boats and ships. It, it's just an endless stream of contamination. Everyone knows the salmon that the killer whales are eating are contaminated. <laughs> the salmon that the seals are eating are contaminated. And why is it contaminated? Because we don't have state-of-the-art uh, wastewater treatment systems throughout the Puget Sound. We don't have them. It's, it's, it's aging infrastructure. I think overfishing is the least of our worries. Um, right now, it's simply managing extinction and fighting over the last fish rather than addressing the problems. The tribes, to their credit, and one of the great ironies of history, I think, is trying to save financial capitalism from itself. And the endless pursuit of profit, short term, the unconscionable socialization of cost <laughs> that goes on and on. These are things that need to be addressed. And I am, I am hopeful, I, I am hopeful that the younger generation has not been so brainwashed by a system that is overtly unfair to everyone but a small percentage, that they are woke to a situation that this is a non-sustainable system. <laughs> if they want to have, now I'll mention something to you. I had dinner in California with some very interesting people. Sitting at my table in Paradise Cove down there near Malibu was a Navajo medicine man and his wife. My host with the director of it's organized the Foundation of Indigenous Medicine, and a young woman who has just st started up her fifth startup, high-tech startup, her fifth. She's also an Olympian medalist, <laughs> mother of two. I mean, you know, one of those people. And she creates virtual reality and security software. Security software for the White House <laughs> and the NSA. She said two things I want to mention. And she said, I can quote her on this. She said, I can teach a nine-year-old to hack into our electoral system. A nine-year-old. One thing. And the second thing she said is, I really prefer the virtual world to the real one. That terrifies me. What really I hope that I'm hopeful that through programs such as yours and people such as you and your listeners, that we don't lose the real world to the virtual one, because the virtual one is, how do I put this? It's not real. And as we compromise the real world, some people are going to escape into their headsets or their earphones. That would be a tragedy. And I, I really appreciate work you do to keep people connected to the real one the real one, because that's the one we are actually birthed from. We didn't create it. We were created by it. And as I mentioned in the before time, we were all one, and it wasn't one in a headset. Hmm. I couldn't agree more with you. It's just... I see a lot of people turning towards virtual reality and I was uh, at a Best Buy <laughs> a few months ago and it was really horrifying. I hadn't been into one of those stores for a really long time and the first thing I saw was this uh, poster of a woman with one of those headsets you know, face masks on. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this is where we're going. We're going to look into a screen at a forest and an ocean filled with orcas. But if we take that mask off, we'll see clear cuts and dead oceans because we are in so many ways being distracted and lost by a world that isn't real. It's these, you know, if you take a picture with a camera, you can create a frame that isn't what reality is you can just you know take yeah. a take a picture but you know if you actually turn 360 you'd see a very different a very different view and i think 
this, this, these extinction crises and what happened with Taliqua, it is these loud cries to wake up and, you know, thinking that there's only 76 Southern residents left and 30, uh, well, less than 30 have the potential to breed. You know, some suggest that if immediate action isn't taken, the Southern resident orcas could become extinct within the next 15 years. So waking up is mandatory if we say we care about our kin. If we really say that we care and we want to actually live up to that, we need to do something. And I, you know, we've been talking a little bit about the Snake River Dam and the issues of we haven't gone into this, but the recreational and commercial vessel traffic, the noises that that make underwater, how that can psychologically and communicatively affect the whales, the pollution, you had mentioned the pollution, the ongoing threats of future pipelines, um, salmon, uh, Atlantic salmon fish farms in BC. So of course, like there are a lot of stressors, but we need to look at these stressors because if we don't look at them with honesty, we're never going to be able to do something about it. And it's true, the population of whales has declined to its lowest levels in 30 years, it has decreased 20% since the since the late 90s. So I, I just wanted to bring those things up. And then back to mentioning Chinook, the fact that two thirds of the southern residents pregnancies have failed due to starvation. Additionally, the lack of food forces orcas to burn their body fat which ends up releasing toxins like DDT and flame retardants into their system, further suppressing their reproductive health. So, you know, these are, again, these are things that we really need to look at, the starvation. And and one thing that I had read while getting ready for this interview is that since 2002, the EIS has designated dam breaching as the best solution to recover wild salmon on the Snake River. And they said that if it was breached, it would double or triple the survival rate of Chinook salmon. So I wanted to bring that up because, yeah, I, I kind of just mentioned a lot of really hard facts uh, around the numbers of extinction and starvation and all of the issues that are affecting salmon, which then in turn are affecting orcas. But then again, look, if we take out the Snake River Dam, that is something that we can do that would have massive positive consequences. So it's not that there aren't solutions, but getting to those solutions, really prioritizing those is where we need to go. And, and that's, I feel like what you were saying with the economic capitalist technological, uh, gosh, just delusion to be able to get out of that so we can actually do the things that need to be done. It's a curious thing. You have a natural condition. Salmon want to be in the Columbia River and the Snake River. Eastern Washington doesn't want to be wheat. <laughs> it's a desert. So they create these dams to sustain an artificial way of life at the expense of a real one. <laughs> I mean, if you look at the Palouse, the bioregion of the Palouse, it is the most compromised bioregion in North America. So little remains of what it once was. I want to mention one thing, though, about the Chinook. Uh, back a second to your folks in, listening in Canada or even in the Northwest are aware that just north of the border here is a very large coal terminal called Sawaston. Very large, very polluting. Well, you mentioned ship noise. The idea they now have is to create another uh, platform that will service ships, container ships. You ready for this? These ships, imagine a football field. Now walk across four of them. That's how big the ships are. They want to have three of those going right over primary orca foraging habitat every two days, year round. And they say, this is an example of the, of the disingenuous nature of EISs. Canadian government does an EIS. Comments are due by October 5th. And then the EIS says, well, you know, this many ships is only a 6% increase in the already existing vessel traffic. And anyway, the southern residents are so highly compromised and won't make much difference. That's the mindset. 
of people that are going to make a lot of money off these ships. But we, you know, the people here, I think it's really important that they understand there may, may come a time, and it may not be far off, when they're going to have to put themselves on the line and their fists in the air and their feet on the ground and say, enough. Stop. That's what it's going to take. Yeah, I know voting is important. Yeah, right. Yes, but feet on the ground and fists in the air is also important. There will be no fishing rights for tribes in the Northwest if men and women hadn't gone to jail, breaking what was then the law. To create a new and better one. And unless people are willing to stand the line, take off their earphones, take off their headsets, and rejoin the world, the real one, we're going to lose it. I taught a class at the University of Washington, forest economics. And, you know, you got a final, everyone gets all bleary-eyed, and they're up all night, and uh, they come in for the final. And I said, well, you all ready for your two-hour final? So put all the chairs in a circle. And I said, I want everyone to give me their definition of extinction. That's a big word, you know. You used that word a while ago. And I think sometimes that word, it's like skipping a stone across the human mind. They don't quite pause for a moment and think about that. Millions of years dedicated to creation of a life form because of someone wanting to make a short-term profit for a small number of people goes extinct? I really believe that tribes, probably more than anyone right now, are the best chance we have. And I really encourage people to stand with tribes when they're standing up for their treaty rights, because treaty rights protect everybody. Everybody. I think personally, even more than the Constitution does at this point, at least in this country. So uh, we're hopeful here. We're, I, we will always be hopeful. And I want to, if you, if I can, before we started this, I, I, I wanted to mention this one verse written by Wendell Berry. Do you mind if I read it? Please. Because we have these moments, and we we look for a place to to resort to our souls and regain our spirits. It's a piece he wrote called The Peace of Wild Things. When despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come unto the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water. And I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time I rest in the grace of the world and am free. So our, our prayers go to J50 and her mother, her family, the Sailor Sea and, and all our relations. And to your listeners that they keep their hope up, <clears throat> even if their pessimism grows. Stay hopeful, because as one person once told me, <clears throat> you're an activist. You are not allowed to lose hope.
think about how she wasn't the only orca ripped from her home, as you had mentioned. In fact, throughout the 1960s and 70s, one third of the Southern residents were taken and sold to parks all over the world. Today, she is the sole survivor of those calves who were taken from the Salish Sea. As orcas who live in captivity often live less than half of their traditional life expectancies. So I'm wondering what are the mental, physical, and emotional stresses of living in captivity without the companionship of other orcas? And why do you think she has survived when others have not? And could it be said that she has remained resilient by remembering her home and the songs of her pod? That's certainly true. There's a number of, I've asked that question of people that know a lot more than I do about her and about blackfish. <clears throat> One answer that has stayed with me is, and she's in a tank, she's in an open air tank close to the water. She hears the ocean. She may think her family's not far away. That's why she sings every night. I don't know if you saw that part of the video in which Dateline TV show went to see Aquarium with a recording of the Elpod's songs. And they went to the side of the tank and where the sequarium minders had stepped away for a while, they turned on the tape recorder. Practically nose to nose with the guy holding the tape recorder. Over and over again. She heard her songs. She heard her pot. That was 1998, I believe. She's never stopped singing her song. <clears throat> I mentioned that I... I worked with a man who was involved in her capture. He was also one of her first trainers. And he said, Tokatai, <laughs> she's an unusual girl. She's very unusual. She is indeed. She's also high as a kite. She's on 14 different kinds of medications. She lives in a chlorinated pool in Miami in the sun. <laughs> So she's on a lot of medications. No one really knows her actual state of health. Be that as it may, she displays vigor. You see when no one's around, she's racing around the pool. She's still happy to be a killer whale, I think, because she really believes she's going home. I was at the aquarium. We went there with Lummi Indians. They followed us. <laughs> They knew who we were before we even got there. We're standing by the side of the tank. And a Lummi tribal member, councilman, and very inspired leader, Fred Lane, is standing with his arms folded across his chest, looking in the water. Down below. She was all the way on the other side of the pond there, the tank. She turns 180 degrees and swims right over to him and just hangs in the water. So I'm going on there. It happened twice, two different visits. So when that was, uh, when it happened the first time and Fred moved aside to recompose his prayers, she went back to where she'd come from. So I walked around the side of the aquarium and I said uh, to the people standing there, can I say hi to her? And this one gentleman, probably in his mid-40s, goes, no. I said, I can't say hi to her? He said, no, but you can say hi to me. And I said, okay. Um, where's she from? And he gave me that that look and he said you know exactly where she's from and then asked me to leave he is the curator of her at the aquarium that's her master i'm sure 
he has a great family life. He's a wonderful man. I'm not saying he isn't, but I am saying what they are doing with her is beyond evil. She needs to come home, and they know it. But I also need to say this. The women that work with her on a daily basis love her. There is no doubt in my mind they love Tokatai. Management, not so much. Cash cow. But they really love that girl. You can see it. So she does have that connection. But it's also kind of the Stockholm Syndrome. She is a blackfish. She needs a family. These women are her family. When she comes back here, we're going to fly her back. That'll express. In one big plane. And she's going to land at Bellingham International Airport. She's going to be taken to the water. Slowly taken out to the sanctuary in Orcas Island. She's going to have her handlers, a veterinarian. She's going to have everyone she needs to reassure her she's okay. And then she's going to start going for walks. Out into the water and back again. Out into the water and back again. She's going to learn to feed herself again. And avoid ships. And then that day will come when her mother's going to go by and go, I know that voice. <clears throat> that is a healing moment for the Elpot from a trauma that, as you said, they have never gone back to Penn Cove again. They were traumatized just like Native folks taken from family and put in boarding schools. They were traumatized. Her coming back to her family will be a healing for that pod. And they need it. Because likely they just lost another one. Oh, Kurt. <sighs> I've just been on mute crying on the other end. Um, yeah, I, I do. I feel um, definitely feeling speechless. And I would just like to offer to you any way you feel like closing this conversation if you'd like to call out to Taliqua and uh, Scarlet, you know, however you wish to to close this conversation, please. Well, that's hard. That's a really hard. Uh, you know, I uh, I had a dream about her, and though I don't remember all the images in the dream, uh, the felt sense, the felt memory sense of that is what I would send back out. You know, and for what it's, what it might mean, is that everything is going to be fine. We're going to be all right. Things will work out. Because, like Scarlet, <clears throat> that fighter, that little fighter, we, we don't lose hope, Scarlet. we will never lose hope. Well, I will keep my prayers and energy towards Scarlet and I, for those who will listen, I ask you to do the same. And Kurt, thank you so much for your love and dedication to the Salish Sea, the Lumi Nation and our more than human kin, the blackfish. Um, thank you for spending this time with us today and we'll continue staying abreast of what is to come and take our actions from you all. Thank you and thank you to all listeners for, for listening.
Thank you for listening to For the Wild Podcast. I'm Ayana Young. The music you heard today was by Montplainser and Amoeba. Our theme music is Silence Returns by Bo and Like a River from Kate Wolf. I'd like to thank our incredible production team, our producer and editor, Andrew Storrs, our research collaborator and writer, Francesca Glassbell, and our media director, Molly Lee Bove, and our music coordinator, Carter Lou McElroy. Follow us on Instagram at four.the.wild. Also find us at drip at d.rip slash four dash the dash wild. And rate us on iTunes if you haven't already. All right, thanks so much. And until next time. From this wild open sky on the concrete trails of wine.